Hey everyone, Nipkex here, and welcome to episode 4 of our tier list series. Uh, the series where, of course, we make a video uh, so that you guys in the comments can uh, not watch any of the video or any of the reasons, jump straight to the end, and then give out about why heroes are placed where they are without actually understanding what the video is about. Ah, it's YouTube comments. You do me proud every day. Um, but yes, obviously with this series, I'm not talking about the viability or the solo leak strength of some of these heroes. This is a series really talking about the game design of the heroes, which heroes I think are fun and are the most interesting in their roles. And then vice versa, which heroes are the least interesting in their roles and uh, probably could have been designed a little bit better. Um, so today we're going to actually uh, be diving into the healers uh, in the game. I decided to come back to melee assassins a little bit at the end. It's obviously the biggest category uh, and the most commonly played category of hero. Uh, so I figured we might, we'll probably leave that one till last. But we'll see how it goes. We, we might switch it up a bit. We'll see, we'll see. Uh, but let's talk about the healers, guys. Let's do it. Uh, first off, we're diving into a whole bunch of heroes whose names begin with A. The healers are kind of top heavy in the... The first half of the the alphabet for whatever reason but we're going with alex straza first and i'm gonna put alex straza into the a tier um i actually think she's phenomenal hero arguably i might i might even move her up to s by the end of the tier list we'll see how i feel coming towards the end but i i think there's an awful lot to like about alex straza um <clears throat> obviously uh, i think her very iconic basic part of her kit, which is very simple, but is very effective, is uh, the healing circle she puts on the ground. She puts it on the ground, it's a big healing circle, her allies can see it, her enemies can see it, if they have vision of that area. Um, and they know that it's going to heal a big nice chunk of max HP to anyone who's standing in the circle. So enemies can look to counterplay, they can look to, to stun or fire off abilities uh, on top of that healing circle, because they know that the enemy team really wants to stand inside of it to get healed. And Alex Strauss's allies can go and move and stand inside of it too. I think that's really quite cool. Uh, I also quite like her E ability, her flame uh, buffet, uh, which uh, does a bonus proc if you hit uh, targets that are burning uh, a second time. So you hit them once, it sets them on fire. If you hit a target that is still burning and still on fire, refunds the mana, does a bit of extra damage. And I think that's, you know, that's quite a little... Quite a fun little thing to add into her kit as well. It's always nice to see some of that, um, a a an interesting damage type of playstyle to uh, add to any particular healer. It's pretty good. It you can even use it against uh, merc camps, against minions, against monsters, and have a little bit of relevance like that, which I think is quite nice. Um, and then even her Q ability is kind of interesting in that you spend your own health to heal your teammates, but you can heal yourself with, with your W, with your area heal. Um, Obviously, the big thing with Alex Straza, there's no question about it, is that her trait is essentially another heroic ability. Dragon Queen turning into a big dragon, empowering all of your basic abilities, empowering your basic attack. Uh, it's just wow. You know what? Fuck it. She's going to S tier. I've decided. It's such a, it's so cool, right? It's such a cool ability. And again, the enemy team knows that, okay, the Dragon Queen has come out. Wow, it's such a, a moment of glory, a moment of being awesome for Alex Straza. It's a chance to really stand out as the healer. You know, probably the number one role that is kind of forgotten, is kind of ignored. Uh, because they're not out there making those aggressive plays. Well, you're certainly making those visible plays as the Dragon Queen. Uh, pumping out tons of healing, keeping your team alive. Such a huge and impactful thing. Much like um, much like Ragnaros's Molten Core ability. It's, it's game defining and I think that's awesome. And it's just part of her base kit. Every Alex Straza has it. It's great. Um, you know, the enemy team can counter play around it. You know, okay, Alex Straza has her Dragon Queen. We want to try to avoid the fight. And then when it's gone, when it's run out and it's on cooldown, we can look to then take a good fight for us. So that's super fun. I also think both of her heroics are quite fun. Obviously those... Uh, they did need some tweaks, uh, particularly uh, her life binder heroic needed quite a few tweaks to make it particularly relevant. But I think it's now in a, in a pretty fun spot. It's an interesting mechanic. Instead of just doing a big single target heal, instead it will uh, link Alex Straza and whoever she cast it on, uh, whichever ally she cast it on, and then bring whoever has the lower maximum percentage health up to the percentage health that the other person has. So... You know, if Alex Straza gets targeted, she can use it to heal herself by picking a high health allied hero 
or if there's an allied hero who's getting focused, she can put it on them uh, while she's high health and, and top them up. It's really cool. It's really interesting, and you know, it's simple but effective. And then, of course, you have uh, the the dragon heroic. What's it called? The fl I I don't know what it's called. The one where it's essentially she turns into an artillery platform, flies up in the air, shoots down some of these blasts that will damage, but also heal. And I think again, it's a really fun ability where you do use it for a little bit for damage, but you can kind of make that choice. You know, do I want to do a little bit of damage, use it aggressively, or do I want to focus it more on healing? Am I able to do both? It's a really fun gameplay loop. So, yeah, I really like uh, what they've done with Alex Strauss. And again, she's got multiple builds. She can build into sort of an E build uh, and have some really cool, uh, aggressive dragon queen attacks happening later in the game, particularly at level 20. Uh, she can build into her W, into some more of that area healing. She can build into her, her Q for some of that single target. Uh, it's quite fun. I think she's a really well-rounded hero. Um... She's got, again, who has got really clear strengths, and I think those strengths are really fun uh, to play as, and she's just a great hero to have in the game. There's no question about it. Um, next up, we've got Anna. I'm going to put Anna in the A tier. I think Anna is one of the most controversial heroes in the game. Um, there have been a lot of balance concerns around Anna, of course. You know, at higher levels of play, she was very overpowered for a very long time and very not fun to play against. Uh, that's kind of in recent memory. However, I do think that Anna, I think she she is a good hero for the most part. With a couple of flaws, but for the most part, a very good hero. Um, she obviously had a, a rework relatively recently, which added aim down sights as an active part of her trait. And I think that really added a lot to the hero. We can, uh, on a short cooldown, you can switch between aiming down sights or not. And really building into that sniper fantasy where your movement speed is slowed down but you get extra range on your uh, healing dart and your sleep dart, and they get the ability to pierce through. I think it's a it's a really fun gameplay mechanic, and it gives her a very strong feeling of, of being a sniper. Uh, I, I think, ironically, Anna has a much better uh, sniper fantasy, a much better feeling of being a sniper than Nova, the actual sniper aggressive hero, does, uh, which I think uh, is a testament to Anna and what she can do. Um, You've got a healing grenade build, which was obviously a bit OP, but has been toned down. Uh, you can build into uh, her sleep darts as well, which is very effective now uh, with recent changes. Uh, one downside I would say is that uh, her, her original trait, which is still there, Shrike, where she applies poison with her basic attacks, she applies these doses, is extremely underwhelming. Uh, and it does some self-healing, which is, again, extremely underwhelming. You can talent into these, uh, this, and again, for the most part, talenting into this is, you guessed it, extremely underwhelming. Probably the most interesting thing she can do is she can take a talent where the dose is mind-numbing poison, I think it's called, uh, reduce the uh, amount of ability damage per dose that enemy heroes can do. Now, I think that's interesting. I would kind of like to see maybe that as being part of her base kit. That would be a fun little gameplay loop that a healer could invest their basic attacks and slowly and make uh, at a relatively small level, though, you know, reducing the damage output that an enemy hero could do and kind of, you know, sniping that in. That might have been fun, but yeah, I feel Shrike's a bit underwhelming. And obviously, Eye of Horus, uh, her lesser heroic is uh is pretty underwhelming as well it gives you a global it gives you some of that sniper fantasy it's actually a pretty cool heroic i would say it's just not very useful it never really has been so that one is yeah um, i'd kind of like i think if i have horus got some buffs it might actually be pretty fun but i i can't think of any particular point where it's been very good and that is definitely a downside for the hero uh on the flip side nano boost i think is a phenomenal heroic probably overpowered in some uh, uh historically at many times it's probably been a bit op but nano boost giving a chunk of mana a chunk of cooldown reduction and a chunk of spell power to one of your allied heroes is a super fun thing for you to do it lets you set up some interesting team compositions and it lets you feel like you're making a really big uh impact on the game when you land that um so yeah for me i like anna a lot uh i like the skill aspect of, of landing all those sniping skill shots uh, I think it's one of the better reworks that we've had, actually. Uh, and yeah, Anna gets a thumbs up for me. I actually think that, that she's pretty good. Though I know that a lot of people do quite hate her. But I, I think she's good, and I'm glad that she's in the game. Next up, we have Anduin. Um, I'm actually going to go... I'm going to put Anduin in the S tier alongside Alex Straza. 
Uh, I I'm a big fan of Anduin. I think Anduin is super fun. Uh, he kind of uh, treads that line of of being a healer that he can get some benefit out of attacking in like a minor way, but but a quite an interesting way, I think. So, for example, at level one, you can choose a couple of talents. Either you can uh, throw in basic attacks with Renew to add an extra heal over time effect to your, your main heal, flash heal. So I think that's kind of fun, you know, a little, it's a little extra gameplay loop to involve those basic attacks, you know, not really for the sake of damage, but just to enhance your healing a little bit. Or then you can go for, um, oh my God, I can't even think of the name of it now, but the other option where uh, every time you do damage, it will heal your lowest health party, me uh, party member near you for a very small amount. It's, it's quite interesting. Or you can go with bold strategy and combine the two, get both benefits, uh, both talents, but with the downside of increasing the cooldown of your flash heal. I think that's a really fun design, you know? It's not a big deal, but it's just that small little extra impetus to do a little bit of damage to enhance your healing. That's fun. And then that also builds into his... Um, his ah, oh, flippin' hell, I should learn these names. The Holy Wave ability, his W, where he... Uh, he, he throws out, um, you know, a, a, a skill shot that does damage to enemy heroes as it goes out. And for every hero that it damages, it will do more healing. And that will come back like a boomerang. A big wave of healing will come back to heal his teammates. I just think it's such a fun heal. Uh, it's just really interesting where you have to think about your positioning. You have to think about your enemy team's positioning so you can hit as many heroes as possible and then you want to think about your team's positioning and catching as many of them in the heal as well or catching the people that need it most i think it's just it's one of the most fun abilities in the game it's one of the most fun and interesting ways of healing where you really get to have a lot of yeah you get to invest a lot of time into really considering the positioning of every single player in the game that's in a team fight and you get rewarded for doing that well which is awesome uh I think Flash Heal is obviously a very simple ability with a cast time, but it's pretty good. He's got a Root as well, which is a nice little bonus for a little bit of extra aggression. It's kind of an interesting shape skill shot, which gets bigger as it goes out. It's pretty cool. Uh, I'm a very, very big fan as well of his trait, the Leap of Faith. Being able on a long cooldown to grab an allied hero who's out of position and, and pull them back to safety and make them unstoppable. Um, you know... I remember, you guys will remember, like, around the start of the HTC, uh, when, you know, Competitive Heroes of the Storm was kind of first getting bigger, um, the cleanse debate was a very big deal, uh, where only supports that had cleanse were, were relevant to the game, and a support who didn't have cleanse uh, really struggled, you know, Blizzard went through, they added lots of cleanse talents at level 7 to a whole bunch of heroes now over the course of the game i think their healer design they really put a lot of work into it and it got a lot better and they ended up actually removing a lot of those cleanses or reworking them and tweaking them a little bit uh but i think leap of faith is probably the most interesting implementation of cleanse it's a really iconic priest ability from world of warcraft uh and that's what anduin has in this game it, it's just you know a, a cleanse which is just a point and click they're unstoppable it's a bit bland, it's a bit non-interactive. You know, it's functional, but it's simple, it's plain. Leap of Faith has got a lot more style to it. It's a lot more flashy. And being able to, to actually move people to safety is really unique uh, as well. So I'm a, I'm a really big fan of that. Uh, but it's got a long enough cooldown that you can play around it. So you know that whenever you do that Leap of Faith, it's going to have a really big impact. And your positioning also really matters there. Um, I think Anduin has a, a relatively simple but interesting talent tree that goes alongside this, uh, where you can kind of spec out a few different ways, uh, look at your self survivability a couple of different ways, get movement speed a few different ways, which is pretty cool. Uh, he's got, I think, especially interesting talents at, at 16 and 20, where you can actually get some bonus abilities that really change up his play style. So for example, he could grab Lightwell at 16, which puts down the healing font, which will heal allies that come in range, pretty cool. Alternatively, he could grab uh, Inner Focus at 16, for example, uh, which will reset uh, the cooldown of his flash shield and make his flash shield next one more powerful. That's pretty interesting as well. Uh, or level 20, get two leaps of faith. Awesome. Or get desperate prayer for that big single target heal, but that will effectively stun Anduin uh, for a couple of seconds. So a big trade-off. They're cool abilities. Now, I haven't talked about his heroics, and I think uh, a, a crucial part of a hero 
uh, that wants to be an S tier really has to have good, two very good and very interesting heroics. And I think Anduin does have that. Now, I'm going to be a bit critical, and you guys know if you watch me playing Anduin, I love playing Anduin, and I play quite a quite a bit of him when I'm healing because I think he's so much fun. Uh, I'm pretty critical of Light Bomb as a heroic. It's obviously the most popular one. It's considered to be the best one. Now, I actually disagree on that. Um, I think one of the problems with, with Light Bomb is that it requires a bit of communication. Uh, oftentimes, at Light Bomb, Light Bomb you, you place it on an allied hero. It's this bomb around them that will explode after a couple of seconds, doing damage, stunning enemy heroes, and it gives that, that, that hero a shield based off of how many heroes they hit with it. Um, so there's a kind of a nice little bit of, of, of team play happening there. I feel like you're more reliant on voice comms to make it work. Very oftentimes when you're playing with strangers, you think they're going to go in, you put a light bomb on them, and they won't hit anyone, or they kind of rush and just hit one person. It's a bit underwhelming. That's relatively common. You see that from Anduin's all over the place. Uh, but it's still a cool heroic with a cool idea, and I think it's a, probably a ton of fun when you're playing with friends or you're playing with people that you know. Um... However, Holy Word Salvation for me is, is a really great heroic. Uh, it comes straight from that cinematic for BFA. Uh, just, it's, it's such a wow moment. And I think it, it really is the, the healing mosh pit, if you will. Uh, it looks absolutely incredible and has an absolutely massive impact on the game. It's a uh, channel for like three seconds, make all teammates within the area protected, so immune from damage. And it also heals them a big chunk of their max health uh, over that duration as well, like 25%, something like that. Um, so it's an absolutely team fight changing heroic, but it, there's so much counterplay, much like Mosh Pit, there's so much counterplay built into it, like one stun, one silence, and bam, your entire heroic is gone, and you're super vulnerable. Uh, so I think that's really interesting, you know, it it, it fits into the, the team fight in a, in a really fun way, and of course Anduin doesn't have that much mobility himself, so you really have to consider your movement, your positioning, I think that's part of yeah, it fits into what makes Anduin so interesting. Is where are you place yourself? Okay, am I placed in a good way? So my my healing wave, you know, I can hit, you know, the, uh, the proper amount of enemies, the proper amount of allies. Uh, am I in position to land a good route? Uh, can I land enough basic attacks to kind of get that that little bit of benefit uh, in terms of the damage, but also in terms of a little bit of extra healing to help out here? Am I in a good position to pull an ally to safety? Am I in a good position to land a good Holy Word Salvation, or will I get interrupted? There's just a whole lot of really fun stuff. I think it's just fun gameplay happening for Anduin. Uh, and I think it's fun to play against too, so yeah. Anduin, I'm a big fan. Next up, we've got Oriel, our last uh, of the beginning with A heroes in their name here. Uh, for me, Oriel is a C-tier hero. Uh, I think Oriel had a nice, uh, an interesting concept when she first came out, which was you put a crown with your trait on an allied hero, and based off the damage they do, they generate energy for you, and you can spend that energy to heal. Okay, it's kind of a cool idea. Um, now, of course, that didn't really work super well. It was very niche, and it was very difficult to balance, and over time, Blizzard has increased the amount of hope, uh, or amount of energy that Oriel generates for herself with her own damage. That's now a much bigger part of her kit. And the, uh, the energy that she gets from allies isn't really as big of a deal anymore. Um, so I think definitely some of her uniqueness kind of fell off uh, with that. Um, but yeah, I also think that it makes her healing kind of feel a bit clunky, a bit wonky. It's not really that interesting. And in fact, the only way to spend your energy is with an AoE heal, uh, which is good if your team is playing around it. And I think, you know, you could probably could have a lot of fun with Aureol with a, a very uh, coordinated team. Uh, that would kind of build the team comp around that and they'd be willing and, and ready to stack up for those Oriole heals regularly uh, and you can kind of you know with a Vala for example or Gul'dan or something with really high damage output as your kind of battery generator it can be very oppressive but I don't really know if it's it's all that much fun though uh, which is kind of my main concern with Oriole uh, I also feel with her Heroic, she just got uh, Resurrect reworked, which was good, because historically Resurrect was one of the worst Heroics in the game for pretty much the entirety of Oriel's lifespan. It was terrible. It's now actually pretty good. Resurrect is now actually really good, so that was a good change to come in. Uh, you know, considering that, you can maybe move her up to B tier with a new Resurrect. Uh, I'm still going to keep her in C tier, though, considering how bad it was for so long. I think Resurrect is now a really interesting ability. 
Um, however, I think her other heroic crystal Aegis, which wasn't the, the only one particularly chosen for the longest time, is actually relatively boring as well. You just put an allied hero into stasis and they explode. It does some damage. It fills up your energy. It's okay, but it's not, it's nowhere near as interesting uh, as like a Holy Word Salvation you know, as Lifebinder even, which is a relatively simple ult, but it's more interesting, or, you know, Nano Boost. These are just way more interesting abilities. Um, and that, for me, makes Oriel a little bit meh. Yeah, I just, I feel like the battery aspect of her is a little bit underwhelming. Uh, her heroics are a little bit underwhelming. Um, she's okay. She's C tier, which is pretty much, they're okay, but they're not really blowing me away at all. Uh, another C tier hero for me, I think, will be Brightwing. Um, so Brightwing, they've been tweaking her a lot recently. And what they're trying to do with Brightwing is to emphasize uh, the Brightwing Q build. So hitting heroes with the center of her, her little solar flare, fairy flare, whatever it's called. She's got a skill shot. She fires it out. It does bonus in the center. And then it does a little bit worse stuff uh, around uh, the area. Um... Yeah, like, they're, they're trying to push her into that sort of skill shot based healer. Uh, the problem I have with it is that it really doesn't feel very fun. It's a bit meh. In fact, I might even knock her down to the D tier, to be honest with you. Like, I'm not a particularly big fan of Brightwing. Um, he's got Polymorph, and Polymorph, I think, is a cool abil uh, ability, and it's very iconic. Turns someone into a sheep. That's awesome. And a nice anti-dive tool. Um, and then I think her Pixie Dust ability is okay, giving some spell armor and some movement speed to an allied hero. It's really only okay. Uh, I, I think in terms of armor giving abilities, you know, compared to let's say Uther, who's got interesting armor granting abilities, I feel like Pixie Dust never really hits that on the mark. Um, I'm not a very big fan either of her heal being these passive pulses. You know, I'm happy that she has this passive heal that she just heals allies near her every few seconds. I'm glad that there's a hero like that in the game. Uh, I just don't know if it's actually all that fun to play as. Um, and then one of the big issues I have with Brightwing, I like Blink Heal as a heroic. I think it's it's fine. It's okay. Uh, Emerald Wind, though, it's iconic. It's interesting. But for me, I do not like the way it's implemented. I actually think it's pretty bad. Uh, what it does is you do a cast, and then this wind comes out and knocks people back. The issue that I have with it is much like the Chen Barrel, uh, which knocks people around, is that knockbacks, I think, in this game are pretty damn annoying. Uh, they can be very frustrating. Uh, I think a lot of us have been in a situation where a Brightwing casts an Emerald Wind and you're beside a wall and you're just getting knocked back against the wall over and over again and you're effectively stunned for a few seconds. But I don't know what it is about it, but it just feels like you should be able to move, you should be able to do more. And it just ends up being a very frustrating stun. I think if you look at League of Legends, for example, and you look at Janna, she's got a, an ult called Monsoon. Uh, which is a very similar idea, which is bam, it's a big area knockback, but with that, the knockback is a lot faster. It's just one single knockback that happens faster, knocks people away, and then she keeps channeling it, and it does a little bit of, I think it does a little bit of a slow to enemies that are in the area, and it heals allies that are in the area as well. I think that's a similar heroic. It gets the same idea, but ends up being a lot more interesting. It's just a lot more fun, a lot less clunky, and I think when you look at Brightwing's Emerald Wind in comparison, it feels feels pretty bad. So yeah, I'm not not a very big fan of Brightwing. Like she's she's okay. Um, you know, it's kind of cool, I guess, to have the global uh, with her teleport ability instead of a mount. It's kind of cool to have a healer that mostly is just doing these passive pulses of healing, but it's just a little bit underwhelming though. At the same time, next we've got Deckard Kane. I'm gonna put Deckard Kane in the B tier. Um, so Deckard Kane, I, one thing I do like about Deckard is he's got some interesting shaped skill shots. His Haradra Cube is a square shaped uh, damage and slow ability. That's kind of fun. Uh, his uh, Scroll of Ceiling is a triangle shaped root, which has got a big wind up. Again, it's pretty interesting and you can combo the two together. You can slow people with Haradra Cube as your Scroll of Ceiling is activating and catch them in the slow, uh, sorry, catch them in the scroll and catch them in a nice big root. That's pretty awesome. Um, I also really like his uh, two heroics. I think they're both very cool. You've got Lornado, which is an example, I think, of a, a non-annoying knockback. It's got a big windup. You can see it coming. Uh, it's good in choke points, but in an open area, it's quite easy to move around it, and it's not that big of a deal. 
but it has enough of an impact that it, that it feels good. It feels relevant, but it's it's not so obnoxious like a Chen Barrel or sometimes an Emerald Wind that it feels like control of your character is being taken away in a frustrating sense. I don't feel Lornado does that. I think it does a good job. Uh, or then he's got his... Um, Oh, what's it? Let, not let me tell you a tale. No, that's that sounds like a pirate. I don't know. Stay a while and listen. That's that's what he's got. That's his other heroic, which again is really fun. You know, a big channel cast time. I get very similar to a mosh pit. Just put people to sleep. It's kind of hilarious. And and an area in front of you as you channel. I think that's a great heroic as well. So I'm a big fan of both of his heroics. I I think then much like Brightwing. When you look at Deckard's healing, that's a bit more of a question mark for me. So the way that Deckard heals is he throws out these healing potions, and allies can walk over the healing potions to get a heal. Um, much like, like I said, with Brightwing's passive healing, I think it's a really great thing that it's in the game. I think it's a unique way of healing, and I'm glad that it's there. The one concern I have with it is that I'm not altogether sure that it's actually that much fun. Uh, it's nice to be there, but is it very enjoyable? For me, at least personally, I I don't think that it, it, it altogether is. I think it's okay, but it, a little underwhelming. Um, I think that, I will say Deckard, I think does have good talents. I really like his gem talents, being able to slot gems into your Heradric Cube and get different effects. So like a Ruby gem, which will make your Heradric Cube shoot out healing potions based off of how many en enemy heroes you hit. That's fun. Uh, Sapphire, which adds an extra slow. An Emerald, which adds a healing reduction. I think that's those are really interesting and interesting choices. Uh, some of his other talents are a little bit more bland, though, compared to that. But still, it's a decent talent tree with some, some cool choices. Um, I think that's totally fine. Uh, I, I would not mind at all. If someone told me that they think Deckard should be in the A tier, I'd be pretty willing and I'd be pretty happy if someone put him up there. If they said, no, you know what, Nubkex, I actually really do enjoy the healing potion mechanic. I think it's super fun. And I think the rest of his kit is, is, is interesting and has gameplay. I'd say, you know what then? Okay. I, I respect that decision and you, you can put him up there and I don't, don't really mind. I'm fine with that. Yeah, but for me, I will just about knock him down into the B tier. Just because I think for the healer, your healing mechanic is probably the most important thing. You know, I think that's why I've got these guys ranked higher. I think that their healing mechanics are just more fun and more interesting. Whereas I think these heroes, yeah, you can see, I think their healing mechanics are not as fun or interesting or engaging. That is the most important thing for me, I think, overall. But there you are. Next up, we've got Karazim. <laughs> and well, I sure I just mentioned it here. I'm sure you can tell I'm not going to be particularly kind here for me Karazim is going to go into the D tier. I'm afraid uh, I'm not a big fan of Karazim. I think that Karazim was quite interesting when he first came out and obviously he was kind of quite relevant, you know, like uh, uh, Bakery uh, was a very famous pro player. He used Karazim a fair bit or, uh, oh my gosh, I can't remember his name, but, you know, he's the, the original healer for MVP Black. Uh, I used to play Karazim all the time. I can't think of his name now. But there were, like, iconic Karazim players. Um, but Karazim has really fallen by the wayside recently. He really dropped off quite a lot. Uh, you know, I, I think there was an interesting idea of being, like, this, this hero who... He could take different uh, different traits at level 1. You could take Transcendence, the healing trait, so every few basic attacks... You heal one of your allies. You could take Iron Fist, where every few basic attacks you do an extra chunk of damage. Or Insight, build up this quest, get mana back, and get cooldown reduction to spam stuff out more. I think that's a really cool idea. I think it just kind of ended up being, I don't know, it just ended up feeling really underwhelming. Uh, and for most of Karazim's existence, certainly at higher levels of play, it was really just all about Iron Fist, and the other two never really saw much play at all. And he ended up being kind of more of a melee assassin who really didn't do all that much healing. Was kind of good at, at diving in aggressively with the team and supporting them like that. But uh, yeah, just for, for a long part of the history of the game, unfortunately, I feel like Karazim has just not really been there as a relevant healer. I think once Blizzard, you know, like, again, these are... If you look at these, these are all more recent heroes, you know. I th Blizzard really added a lot of healers to the game. Uh, which I think had more interesting and good gameplay. And I think Karazim kind of got a little bit left behind, in my opinion. Um, uh, Brightwing, well, I moved Brightwing down to D to go. You know, I'm moving Brightwing down to D to go with him. I think same thing with Brightwing. Brightwing, tried, they tried to rework her, and in my opinion, hasn't been that really that interesting. Sorry, I'm moving people everywhere here. I'm, I'm a bit tired, so I guess I'm like 
Uh, I'm changing my mind as we go. <laughs> but maybe it's fine. I don't know. But yeah, Karazim. You know, I like Seven Sided Strikes. I think that's cool. I think it's 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 an iconic ability. Uh, maybe a bit too aggressive for what the healer does. Just doing like damage without having a real healing effect or a, a team play effect is maybe a bit eh for me. Uh, and then Divine Palm. Divine Palm is pretty cool. Uh, but again, one problem I think I have with Karasim is that most of the time you see them going for seven-sided strike. It's kind of like the healer that people want to play if they don't want to heal. Uh, they actually just want to play damage and they go, okay, well, fine, I'll pick Karasim so you guys are happy you have a healer. But yeah, I don't know. I, I think especially with the role rework, he kind of got left behind a little bit. And yeah, nah, Karasim, I'm sorry, my friend. You, got, you have the potential to be really cool, but you kind of got left a bit in the dust. Uh, next up, we got Lili. And I actually think Lili is a nice hero. I'm going to put Lili in the B tier. I'm glad Lili's in the game. She's a hero that, uh, you know, a healer essentially without skill shots, right? Uh, her Q just auto heals uh, someone who's close to her with the lowest health. Uh, her E ability, her blinding winds, automatically blinds two targets that are close to her. Uh, her heroic about, like jug of a thousand cups, uh, it, it just automatically heals the lowest health ally in a large area around her, or Water Dragon, the other heroic, automatically attacks the nearest enemy hero. You know, there's a lot of auto-targeting happening with Lili, but I actually think that's pretty okay. And I actually think there's a lot more complexity to Lili than people give her credit for. Uh, much like Anduin, I think her positioning really matters. Um, you know, it's, there's a deceptive amount of... of of mastery that you can put into Lili in terms of exactly where you put yourself in the team fight to kind of make that stuff work, which I think is pretty good. Um, but I don't know. I just think that Lili, she's a lot of fun to play. Um, especially with Jugs, I think, is a really fun heroic to use. You just feel like you're doing a lot of healing. It feels really impactful, which I think is what you want to do as a healer. It's fun as a healer to, to feel that you've got those buttons where it's like, man, okay, now I'm the healer, now I'm the man, or now I'm the the tiny teenage panda girl, uh, I guess, um, who's you know keeping the team alive and and really being awesome, you know, being a noticeable playmaker. And I think that Jug and and Water Dragon is an offensive thing with a big slow actually managed to achieve that. Uh, and I think it's quite fun, you know, landing blinds at clutch times against, you know, a gray main or like a butcher trying to dive your teammates. Landing that perfect blind to keep your team alive, I think is really fun. Uh, she's got some fun talents as well with, you know, fast feet and being kind of sneaky, being elusive. I think it's really nice. Um, you know, I, I don't think, I, I, I think it'd be silly to put her into a higher tier. Um, but for me, I think she is like a good B tier hero. She's good. She's solid. She's interesting. Uh, and yeah, I think she's actually a lot of fun to play. Um, so for me, Go, Lily. I, I, I like you. There you go. Uh, next up, we got Morales. I'm going to put Morales in the B tier as well. Uh, again, I think Morales, much like Lily, she's a very simple he uh, healer, a very simple character. Uh, but I think that her core concept, her core fantasy is is really good. It's really solid. She is like the, the medic bodyguard. <laughs> she just kind of latches a healing beam onto a target and kind of follows them around and keeps them alive. Um, she doesn't have a whole lot going on interesting uh uh, in terms of, like, offense, that's interesting. Whereas, you know, obviously Deckard's got loads, or Anna can land some sleep darts or aggressive healing grenades, and that's cool. Or Lily can land clutch blinds, whatever. These other heroes have a bit more going on aggressively. Morales has her grenade with a knockback. But outside of that, that's really all she's bringing in terms of interacting with the enemy team. But she's just kind of running around behind her team and, and single target healing them up. But it's very simple. It's very basic. But I actually really like it. I think it's a fun healing style. Uh, it, it fits in for that person that wants to be kind of the pure healer, the pure medic, the, the bodyguard, keeping someone alive, just applying armor and healing. I think she does that. I think in kind of a fun way. So, yeah, I actually quite like her. She also has two, I think, very interesting heroic abilities. Uh, Stim Drone, just, you know, supercharge. It's like the nano boost for basic attackers. Just supercharge one of your basic attackers and let them blast away. 
Um, or then the medivac, which gives you like a global traveling option, which I think is pretty awesome. I actually also love her level 20. Uh, there's a bonus medivac talent she could take. I actually was blown away the first time I saw it because I didn't even know it was in the game. Because Morales, she does not play that much at high level, really. Uh, but she can actually, even if she doesn't have medivac at level 10, you can take a medivac talent at level 20 and like medivac people from the core to lane or to the team fight. I think that's really fun and awesome. Um, but yeah, I think she's a good example, much like Lily of a simple healer, but one that, that that does their job well. Next up, we've got Lucio. I'm gonna put Lucio in the C tier. Um, Lucio, it's a tough one for me to place, I'm gonna be honest with you. Um, you know, I, I kinda like the idea of what Lucio does, having your movement speed track, having your healing track and switching between them. And I really, really do like the gimmick of his trait of wall riding. Uh, instead of using a mount and being able to zip along walls and build up extra movement speed and, and and to play like that I think that gimmick is really fun What's not so fun for me about Lucio is most of the rest of his kit. Uh, I'm gonna be honest with you uh, I, I I think some of the changes they made to him as well with the recent rework kind of lowering the speed aspect of his kit Making him slower making the speed boost slower took away some of what made him kind of unique and interesting um I, that's just one of the problems. Like, I try to think of, of situations where uh, Lucio's have made interesting speed boost plays, you know, in the games I've seen or the games I've played in myself. And the amount of interesting plays with that are just so few and far between. I think it's kind of a wasted opportunity in a large sense. Most of the time, Lucio is just amping up his healing, uh, his healing song. Because outside of that, his healing is, is really bad. You kind of just need to. So, yeah, I just feel like there's a bit of a design problem there in the way that he's designed. I do think Reverse Amp is really fun and using your healing song also as a damage source. I think that's cool and like wall riding and doing some aggressive knockbacks, like going behind the enemy team and knocking them back. I think that's cool, but it's a little bit too, a little bit too limited and, and his kit as a healer does feel a little bit bland in terms of what you're doing. Also, when we look at his heroics, I think Sound Barrier is awesome. I think that's super cool. Big cast time, you have to be close to people, so there's a, always a real risk that, you know, an ETC uh, face melt will knock you away and interrupt you. Um, there's always the risk of stuns. It's got good counterplay. I think it's a great heroic. High five, however, number one is really struggled to be particularly, like, useful or versatile or viable. It's just really not there. It also just lacks any interesting animation whatsoever. It's bizarre. It's, it's literally a heroic ability with... You, you just run to them really fast. There's no there's no actual high five animation. It was just because it wasn't part of his original kit. Um, Reverse Amp was actually his original second heroic because they added high five in later. It just never felt really all that incorporated into his kit and it never had an animation. So for me, that definitely stopped the hero from being well designed. Um, you know, like for example, Sylvanas got mind control as a heroic, which is also terrible. But at least it has a cool animation and it looks interesting. Uh, Lucio High Five doesn't manage to do that. So, yeah, sorry to Lucio fans. Uh, but for me, he's a bit meh. And his rework was also, unfortunately, unlike the Ana one, for example, was a little bit meh and didn't really enhance the hero. Next up, we've got Malfurion. And I'm actually going to put Malfurion in the S tier. Uh... I, historically, I have not enjoyed Malfurion. I did not like him, but I've kind of come to a new appreciation of Malfurion. And I also think that his rework was a pretty nice one. Um, but I like Malfurion a lot as a healer. Uh, interestingly, originally, before his rework, there was no interaction between his Q and his W, so his regrowth and his moonfire. Um, so originally, your regrowth is just a heal over time effect. You just put it on and did its thing, and moonfire is just a damaged thing. Uh, a damage attack and it did its thing and they didn't interact his rework made the two go together so you put regrowth on and moonfire when you hit an enemy hero it gives a burst of healing to every ally who has regrowth on them it's a very simple change a very small change but made the hero a lot more cohesive and a lot more interesting and it just adds a fun gameplay aspect to the hero and it captures that sort of healing over time effect uh that the idea of being a restoration druid, really from, from World of Warcraft and healing over time. And he does that, and I think that's good. Um, Entangling Roots is obviously, it's a, a short range, but very impactful uh, ability. And again, very iconic. Uh, I think it's one of the most fun kind of root abilities in the game. Uh, and it's really cool to have that on a support. And then he's got 
Again, it's kind of like a mini nano boost in Innervate. Give a, an ally some mana back and some cooldown reduction. It's simple, but it's fun. Uh, and he's got two really great heroics. Tranquility, a nice channeled heroic uh, for that sort of extra healing output. Again, healing over time, though. Uh, or then Twilight Dream, which is the more interesting one, I think. The big playmaking heroic, where again, in short range of Malfurion and him being a squishy, vulnerable healer. But if you do go in and position yourself aggressively, bam, the Twilight Dream. A nice burst of damage emanating from you. A big silence effect. Really badass and a really cool playmaking thing. But again, I love the trade-offs that you have going with Malfurion. It's like, yeah, those roots can be super impactful. Twilight Dream can be super impactful. Um... But you got to put yourself at risk to get some good ones out. Or same thing, you know, getting those really good moon fires, getting good healing on your teammates, that, that takes some skill. But I think that it is a lot of fun. And he's got cool talents as well. I like his cleanse talent, Nature's Cure, one of the more interesting ones where you can remove stuns from people that have regrowth. So again, kind of tying in some of those synergies. Uh, I love the treant you can spawn uh, with your entangling roots that will attack. I think that's pretty cool. Uh, Again, like relatively simple hero in some ways, but I think he just kind of captures a, a cool identity and it's got cool playmaking. Uh, so for me, he does just about make it into the S tier. Could be an A tier hero, but for me, I think Malf is an S tier. He's just a cool, interesting healer with good playmaking, a good healing mechanic, uh, and kind of a unique identity with that healing over time effect. Uh, Regar. Regar could arguably go into the S tier as well. I'm going to put Regar as a, a really solid A tier hero for me. Uh, Regar is, again, one of the most fun heroes, I think, for me to play. Um, I think compared to... I think Karazim and Lucio tried to capture that feeling of being an aggressive healer and kind of... I'm going to be honest with you, kind of didn't really succeed all that well. It's certainly not in the modern game. I don't think they succeed that well. Whereas Regar does. I think Regar has got a good feeling of being aggressive. You know, um, I think the Ghost Wolf in particular works really well for that, giving you that instant mount, that instant mobility, the lunge attack. You know, using that for a bit more damage in team fights or lightning shielding yourself, being able to fight Merc Camps, being able to fight Minion Waves. I think it ends up actually being really fun. Uh, his kit ultimately is quite simple. His, his, his basic kit isn't really that mind-blowing. The mechanics aren't all that amazing. You know, chain heal. It's a point-and-click heal that sort of bounces around and auto heals. It's not particularly special. Lightning shield, you put it on someone, just does some damage near them. It's not very special. Uh, Earthbind totem, it's a slowing totem. It's okay, but again, it's, it's not amazing. It's just all right. Uh, ancestral healing, it's a big single-target point-and-click heal. Uh, you know, it's got that cast time, so there's some interesting play and counterplay there, but it's not, it's not extraordinary in any way, shape, or form. And then Bloodlust is obviously a super fun meme heroic, but it doesn't really see much play. So again, when you look at Regar, I think his, his spells, his kit, his ability, uh, his abilities just aren't, like, they're not jaw-dropping. They don't have, like, really interesting ways of playing them you know like th it, there's nothing the equivalent of a dragon queen there's nothing i think on the level of twilight dream or salvation uh, or you know anna sniping for heals you know that stuff is just not as th there's nothing that amazing but at the same time when you put all that stuff together just the way the kit comes together i don't know exactly what it is but it just ends up being a really satisfying experience that kind of just flows naturally and it does kind of give you that freedom to be a little bit more aggressive and to, to feel that you are kind of you know half healer half wolf and kind of in a sort of weird sort of way uh, and it works i think it really does and i like regar i think he's good solid and he's, he's just a great healer in the game and one i'd really recommend to anyone to play you'll have a lot of fun um yeah but does he blow me away is he s tier i think not quite no question for me that he is a easily an A tier hero. That's great. Uh, another A tier hero, I think, is Stukov. I, one thing I love about Stukov is he really does break the mold of, of of a healer. Like he just he looks bizarre, man. Like he's like a Russian general. Like what the hell's going on with a giant alien arm? It's really strange, isn't it? It's not the the typical healer at all, <laughs> which I think is cool. And then I also love the theme of Stukov of how it's all about like infection and infestation. I think that's 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 really unique. I also really enjoy the interaction between um, his his healing 
pathogen, I guess it's called, where you kind of bounce it around and allies transmit it to each other. And then you can choose the moment to pop that healing pathogen with your trait on a long cooldown to do a big burst heal. So that has some really interesting and fun gameplay, I think, where you have to consider where your teammates are going to go, passing that pathogen around. Uh, and then deciding, do I want to pop it now for a big heal? Or do I want to keep that sort of slower heal over time ticking? Uh, can I get it to bounce to an extra person and get a pop on an extra person to hit all my team? Or do I need to pop it now? It's just a fun gameplay mechanic. And then you add in the fact that you also have... I, again, I forget the names. I'm so sorry. But he's got his W ability, which is, again, a skill shot. But applies a negative effect, which you can also pop uh for bonuses and I, I you know, for bonus damage and a bonus slow on the enemy hero and i think the fact that you can do the two at the same time it just ends up being a really cool gameplay style right it's really awesome uh and you can have some interesting talents that talent into that like popping a, a an offensive pathogen on just a single hero can reduce the cooldown of your pathogen popping and you can pop more popping on your popping allies it's great fun uh and then he also i i will say his e uh, obviously, his, his lurking arm, uh, putting out that silence effect, was pretty obnoxious at one point in the game. Like, the Maiev Stukov heyday was pretty freaking bad. You just pick Maiev and Stukov. Stukov could just put down the arm from miles away, so there's not a chance of interrupting him. The arm would last forever, and it'd be growing this big silence area. You put that with a Maiev, and she just hooks everybody in. It was disgusting. That was one of the worst balance patches in the game. That was not a fun time to play. Uh, yeah, the, the great Maiev catastrophe of her release. Uh, but obviously they, they nerfed that and changed that a whole lot. So now I think his silencing arm, uh, it's no longer a really obnoxious ability that's really frustrating to play against. I think by removing a lot of those talents, they actually did a really good thing, uh, and made it, like, a, an ability that has impact, but it's not, like, uh, yeah, it's just not degenerate, shall we say. It's not that bad. Uh, he also has two interesting heroics, which I think is always a plus, of course. Uh, the massive shove, short cooldown, skill shot, push somebody really far away. And again, you kind of have to consider that if you want to push them across the entire map, you can. You can push them into your base, which is obviously tricky to do because you're a vulnerable healer. Um, and obviously, you have to consider that the further you push them, the longer you're you're actually pushing and, and can no longer, essentially, you're stunning yourself. So there is that trade-off, which is cool. Or then you've got the flailing swipes, the big knockback. Uh, not as interesting, but at least it's there. Uh, and one nice thing with Stukov as well, I think, is his basic attack is awesome. It's just, you got a big, massive, like, tentacle arm, and you just smack people with it. And you hit ridiculously hard, but ridiculously slowly. I think it's a really fun gameplay mechanic, too. So, yeah, that's what I really like about Stukov. I just love the theme of Stukov. He's just so different and so weird. And, you know, if somebody told you to design, you know, a healer character for a fantasy MOBA... The crazy weird disease Russian general is definitely probably not the first place your mind would go. And that makes him kind of special for me. Next up then, we've got three more heroes to go here. Next one we have is Taronda. I'm going to put Taronda in the B tier. Obviously, Taronda has had a lot of different iterations, a lot of different reworks to try to fit her into the game. And, uh, and as Blizzard really struggled to figure out exactly what she was going to be, she's now settled into the healer role, into being a main healer. Uh, and again, I think Taronda is an attempt... Well, I don't think she is an attempt, of course, to be that sort of aggressive healer. Very focused on landing basic attacks to give her cooldown reduction on her heal, um, which I think is cool. Uh, and I do really like Taronda. She's one of my favorite heroes to play. I think she's a blast to play. I think she's really fun. Uh, one of my main criticisms, though, of Taronda is that I feel that she is a little bit hectic. Um, one thing I was thinking about when I was looking at Taronda was, I feel like it would almost make more sense if they, like, remove the owl as one of your main abilities and swaps it onto your trait. Right, and the trait could be your owl, and it would just scout. It wouldn't do any damage. It was just a vision scouting ability, and then add hunter's mark in as an active ability. I even wonder if that might be more interesting. Uh, though I suppose there are some interesting owl talents with the first person you hit, um, you know, getting reduced damage effect. I think that's quite fun or a big slow. That's interesting. That's cool. Um, but yeah, like Tronda's abilities, they're kind of fun to use. But I do feel like you got a lot going on. In the team fight playing as Taronda, you got the short range hunter's mark to apply. You got two charges of your heal to use. You also need to track and make sure you're basic attacking as much as you can, getting that cooldown. You don't want to waste charges of your heal. I think it's a good play style, but I just do feel like it's a little bit hectic. Uh, I feel like 
you know, a hero like Anna manages to be really high skill without feeling half as hectic. You know, you've got those, it's more about those big decisions. Or same thing with Alex Straza. You know, you're making those big decisions, those impactful plays. It doesn't feel so hectic. I guess actually part of the reason I feel it's hectic is that Tyrande's heal is, is relatively weak, isn't it? Her Q ability, the heal that it does, it's not really that big. It's not that chunky, you know, compared to, uh, you know, compared to like an Alex Straza W, for example. Uh, it's not as chunky. So that is something of a downfall. Um, but yeah, I think she does a decent job of, of being that sort of the, the range, the bow using, Priestess of the Moon, that you're kind of half attacking, half healing. Um, I, I think they had a tough job in terms of fitting her in and in terms of having to change the hero as the game went on because she was in a weird place. And I think they've done a decent job. She's a good, solid B-tier hero. She's fun to play. She's a great addition to the game. They did a good job with her. She definitely does stand, I would say, stands in contrast to Karazim, who really didn't succeed at keeping up with the game. I think Tyrande has, and she's nice. Shadowstalk's a good heroic. Uh, Starfall is okay. Again, it sort of adds to the hecticness. A lot of the viability of Starfall is in reducing the cooldown of your Q. So it's a little bit clunky. It's a little bit wonky. But she's a pretty okay hero. Uh, next up, we've got Uther, and I'm actually going to put Uther probably in the A tier. You know what? Actually, I'm not. I'm putting Uther in the S tier. I think Uther's really cool. I actually think Uther's really cool. One thing I love about Uther is that he builds into a type of healer that none of these other healers do. He is like the, the half tank, half healer, right? He's the frontline healer. Uh, you know, he, just, he heals himself naturally. Uh, with basically all of his abilities and he applies armor to himself with all of his abilities he has a melee range stun with hammer of justice uh, so he is very much a frontline brawling hero he's even seen a lot of success recently as even a main tank uh, or an off tank played in a solo lane um so uther he kind of has that flexibility which is pretty cool actually uh he's got two great heroics as well with uh, divine shield uh, very simple, but, you know, point and click invulnerability on a teammate really enables some heroes and is a really powerful and good feeling save on that hero. Uh, or Divine Storm, which is a really fun aggressive uh, heroic, which builds into that more frontline aggressive Uther playstyle. Uh, and yeah, I just, I like a lot about what Uther does, you know, being that frontline guy. I also really enjoy the fact that his healing output is okay, but it's not overwhelming. And that a big concern with Uther is is in your devotion, your traits, your passive that you apply. Whenever you heal somebody, you give them a big chunk of armor. And I think that's really fun, actually. I think it's a really a nice way of doing things where you're not simply considering the healing output, the raw healing output that you're doing, but that you can also use heal sort of preemptively or heal people earlier than you would as a kind of preventative measure, as a way of applying that armor to protect them and keep them a little bit safer. And I think that's nice. And he's got fun talents too, like Holy Shock, lets him use his Q aggressively. Uh, he can have Holy Fire, where he gets in there and, and smacks dudes with his hammer and starts doing a Burning Rage effect around him. That's all cool. Uh, and he's got some great level 20s too. Obviously, Redemption being the iconic one where he dies, becomes a ghost, and heals people while dead, and then comes back to life. It's really awesome. Um, so yeah, I actually think Uther's pretty, pretty great. He's pretty fantastic. Uh, kind of succeeds. I, I, I think, you know, they, they obviously struggled in sort of combining the, the more damage dealing and healers. You know, that thing, like, Tastar is a struggle to fit into the game. Um, I feel like Ariel, uh, Karazim was definitely a struggle to fit into the game. You know, Tyrande, we already talked about her. She was a struggle to fit into the game. That's to be changed. Uh, I think Uther, the attempt to kind of fuse tank and healer, actually worked really well. Uh, and Uther is kind of, he's been around in, in a similar state to how he's always been and, and been successful and, and been an interesting healer. Uh, so yeah, for me, actually, I'm a fan of Uther. I mean, he goes in the S tier for me. His model's a little bit stocky and yeah, but it's all right. He's got cool armor. We'll give him that. And finally, we've got White Mane. <laughs> okay, we're gonna end up. We're gonna be harsh. Fuck it. Let's do. Let's do. Put her in the F tier. Fuck, dude. Oh, oh. Let's be dramatic for the end. Uh, I don't know. She might be like a, a D tier hero for me either. Um, I think pre rework White Mane would probably have been an A tier maybe, maybe even S tier, no, probably it should probably just be an A tier hero, but for me, pre-rework white main was really fun, why, I, I actually sat down, I was thinking about this quite a lot, because it's obviously the white main rework was a, a big topic of contention in the last year, um, but I think the interesting thing about pre-rework white main was actually the high inquisitor talent, 
It was obviously very badly balanced, and she had a ton of balance issues in terms of her design and what she was supposed to do. But I think the unintentional best way, of best way of playing her, the High Inquisitor way, actually was super fun. What it did was, whenever you cast uh, your Inquisition ability, it would just reset all of your Desperation stacks. So the way she works, she's got a, a mana pool. Every time you cast her heal, you get a stack of Desperation, which lasts a few seconds. Uh, and that increases the mana cost of her heal. So if you spam out that heal a few times in a row in quick succession, you spend all your mana and you're screwed. Um, well, the High Inquisitor talent made it so that whenever you, you use the Inquisition, it would remove all those Desperation stacks and actually give you mana back based off of them. And it added a really fun sort of uh, rhythmic playstyle to her, where it's like, okay, cast a couple of heals, get some Desperation, bam, throw out my Inquisition, uh, and just burn that Desperation off and get mana back. Okay, cool. And now I'm going to do a, a few sort of slower heals. Uh, I can maybe invest some of my mana if we're fighting and, and doing a few more costly heals while Inquisition's on cooldown. And then once it comes back, cool, I'm back in the nice cool rhythm. I can start regening mana and refreshing the Desperation and we're all good and it's nice and it's fun and it's cool. I think that's actually a really fun playstyle, I, and I want that back, and it sucks that it's gone. And she also had really cool talents, like, um, I love the, uh, oh, I can't remember what it's called, but the one where you pop it and it would, it would give you a ton of bonus healing, a ton of bonus spell power, but give you uh, negative armor. They obviously re-added that to her rework in her trait uh, in a weaker form. Which I think is a little, it's okay. I'd rather have it back in the stronger form though, to be honest with you. And have it like that, that really kind of mad Inquisitor feeling to it. Of like the big trade-off of, yeah, I'm doing loads of healing. But now I'm super vulnerable to being killed myself. I think that's, that's fun. And definitely something that she has lost. I think the problem with White Mane and why she goes into the F tier. Is that what they wanted to design her as. Was they want her to play more around the healing people through dealing damage with zeal, right? Again, another sort of semi-failed attempt, or in this, in this case, I actually do consider it a failed attempt at a healer that heals through doing damage. And I think the idea, what they want her to be, is that you apply your zeals with your heal, and then through your basic attacks and your damaging spells, you heal people with that that zeal effect. It's like a heal over time effect, essentially, that you enhance through doing damage. And that's why they added, you know, that sort of saintly great staff, that basic attack build, which ended up being super overpowered and broken and had to be really nerfed and reworked again. Uh, when they rework to rework, uh, it's a total disaster. The problem I have with this build is it just doesn't really work and it's just not very fun. It's just not as fun as the old High Inquisitor just playing with Desperation Stacks build. That's more fun. That's just better. Um, one big problem with her uh, which I haven't mentioned yet, but ties directly into that is, well, what are your ways of, of, of doing damage to generate that healing through zeal? Well, Searing Lash or E ability is one of them. And I think it's a really bad ability. It just feels bad to use. It's really clunky. For a healer that's supposed to be about doing damage to heal people, she's got this really short range skill shot ability that's, it's slow, it's it's inconsistent. It's just really underwhelming and meh. You do a lion skill shot. If it hits a hero, it will do another cross. You know, like, great, you got the religious cross theme going. That's all right. But in practice, it ends up just feeling really meh. It just doesn't feel good. Uh, it's it's just kind of a mess, in my opinion. Um, so, yeah, I, I, don't, I just don't like it. I honestly think if they switched white main more towards the high inquisitor playstyle, more about balancing desperation you know balancing uh, mana costs and being able to spend crazy amounts of mana but then be mana starved uh being able to you know up your healing but at the cost of making yourself more vulnerable i think that would have been a lot more interesting instead of pushing her towards that applying these and maintaining these zeal effects and then doing damage to heal it just doesn't really work when your ability to do damage is is really quite underwhelming. I do have to say the laughs that she does when you use that uh, Inquisition or cast it on an ally with the Clemency ability, they're really fun. I like that. But um, yeah, I think it was one of the, the bad reworks, unfortunately, they did in the game. I don't think it was good. I think it made the hero, in attempting to fix a balance problem, I think it actually made the hero a lot worse. And that's a downside. And there you go, guys. Those are the healers in the game. As always, let me know what you think. Uh, and of course, always welcome those comments. Uh, thinking that this is a tier list about which heroes are the strongest. Um, <laughs> oh boy. But yeah, that's what I think about the healers. On the whole, I think we have a lot of really good healers. We've got a nice little spread here. Again, it's more top heavy. We've got a lot of interesting healers in the game. Um, you know, a lot of unique 
uh, healing styles as well, which I think is great to see. I think that the designers actually, on the whole, knocked it out of the park with the healers. Um, you know, I think healing was a bad role. Honestly, it was terrible. I think they recognized that a couple of years ago. And they said, we're going to make it better. And they released a ton of healers that were super fun. They threw in a couple of reworks. Like, you know, they reworked Uther a bit. Anna, Malfurion, Tyrande. And they made those healers, like, a lot more interesting and fun. Brightwing got reworked, but it was kind of a bit meh. You know... Uh, I thought they did a great job of improving the role, and I think it's one of the best parts of Heroes of Storm, actually. I think the healer role is great, and that's my thoughts on that. That's my thoughts on these guys. Let me know what you think, and I'll see you all next time. Bye-bye.